So at this point, I present to you Dr. Robert Grant Kaplan. Thanks very much, and uh, compliments to the organizers of this program because <coughs> fake news is all over the news these days. We're always talking about it. Not just this year, but in recent years, journalists began to uh, give us the idea, especially when the discoveries began to emerge about the uh, Russians and their interference in the election and so on. And so there was talk about you know the whole history of fake news and how long has this been with us? And the notion is it's been around for a long time. So fully compliments to, uh, to David and to Charlie for helping to get this going and to uh, my friend, uh, new friend now, Chet, who's going to join me in this uh, enterprise of looking at the story of fake news. So it's a problem that's very old, as David said. We can all the way go back to 300 years or so. The author Jonathan Swift said, uh, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it. <laughs> and I even got a sight, uh, an insight from Leonardo da Vinci today to go way back in history to suggest that the concern about this problem has been with us for a long term time. But in, in recent years especially, and I want to get to this at the briefly at the end, but I know Chet's going to pick it up and carry it in a, much, uh, in a better way as we get to look at it in more detail. But the recent events, so kind of a shock about how much this is coming into our life with the internet and with uh, uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and all the rest, and so it's become uh, something so easy to pass around. And so there's great concern, and we've been hearing talk about the, the new age. Maybe we're in the age of post-truth, some say. What, whoa, that sounds scary, post-truth age. So a lot of discussion about it. So why does um, this idea fly with people? Why does it resonate so often? That is the false. Uh, the the uh, information that may be embellished and stretched and so on. So sometimes it's a stretching of the truth and sometimes it's an outright falsehood. But why does it appeal to people? I'd like to offer some ideas about this. There's so many ideas one could offer, but I'll try that. And then also I want to turn to you and seek some help on trying to get some insights on all of that. Uh, so why does it work? So here's the plan. Let's see if our technology is operating well. Okay, so the plan is uh, to begin uh, backing off a little bit and playing with some concepts to think about how others, uh, psychologists, and some historians thinking about psychology, have tried to understand why we fall for this stuff. You, me, everybody, all of us in society, uh, we tend to uh, go for it sometimes. Uh, we, we believe in it. So the appeal to emotions and how we get uh, tied into a certain belief system that suggests we're more vulnerable than we would otherwise be to these uh, falsehoods. And then I'd like to go, we're historians now, I'm an historian at least, so I want to uh, go over with you some of the examples from American history. I'll look first at elections, and then we'll take a look at uh, some of the drumbeats for war in our history and how you might say uh, fake news played a role, sometimes a significant role, sometimes a small one, but uh, nevertheless, there's an impact that we can trace to some degree. And then, uh, also along with these lines, language, words that have emotional impact have been used very effectively as a kind of shorthand to communicate these, uh, these notions that would stir your emotions, but not really register with the truth. And so we'll look at that. And finally, very briefly at the end, why now? What's changed? Why is it so much a, a bigger uh, presence on the radar screens today as we think about you know the problems of society we're talking about fake news what's happened recently that elevates this to uh, the front pages of our discussion so that's the plan for our movement now okay um, so let me begin uh, with what these events have in common and to give you an example we'll start off with the uh, the fellow who's so prominent where I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. If you ever visit my town, you'll discover uh, Jefferson's presence is everywhere. There's Jefferson this, Jefferson that, library, you name it, and his statue is all around town and all that. Thomas Jefferson, what an interesting man. And of course, Monticello is there, 
and the University of Virginia was planned and designed at first by Thomas Jefferson. So if you think about that election back in 1800, it was Thomas Jefferson versus the man who was the incumbent president, for one term at least at that time, John Adams. And it was a nasty, bitter thing. It was not what George Washington, the president who ran us, our country for two terms, uh, wanted. He wanted to have uh, togetherness and uh, work in cooperation and uh, people uh, not being caught up in divisions, factions, and the word that became prominent, parties. But of course, in the 1790s, <coughs> divisions and parties began to appear. In time, we had the Federalists of Adams versus the Democratic Republicans of Mr. Jefferson. So you recall that when there's Tom Hanks and there's uh, Paul Giamatti playing John Adams in the HBO series, and it won an Emmy. And so one of the producers was Tom Hanks, and he was uh, getting up to accept the honors. And he had something to say that resonates with us today. He said, the election between Jefferson and Adams was filled with innuendo, lies, and bitter partisan press, and disinformation. How far we've come since then. <laughs> <laughs> so you look at some of the axemen, you might call them, the, the guys in charge of uh, spreading rumors and false information. One was uh, working for Jefferson's team was James Callender, and uh, he had uh, some vicious things to say about John Adams. Now, the words that began to spread in the newspapers and so on were such as these, uh, that John Adams is one of the most egregious fools on the continent who wants to become the American king. Um, some nasty stuff. Uh, you might say uh, there was an association of the Federalists with aristocracy in America, but this is really going over the top. By the way, just to, before I get on to the rest of the story, James Callender spread these false stories and so on, and got into trouble with libel, had to go to prison over it. And uh, he wasn't satisfied that Jefferson was taking care of him as he'd be released from the bars. And uh, he was angry at Thomas Jefferson. So by 1802, he was spreading information about a certain Sally on the plantation <laughs> that Thomas Jefferson had a special relationship with, and she was a slave woman. So that was the origins of that story. But anyway, on to our bigger tale. Uh, the Adams team, uh, they came uh, right up front with news about Thomas Jefferson. Here's one of them that appeared in public, uh, that Thomas Jefferson, if you elect him, what will we have in America? Quote, murder, robbery, rape, <laughs> adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of distress. The soil will be soaked with blood, the nation black with crimes. You want to vote for Thomas Jefferson and all that. And, and it resonated with some because it was an association of Jefferson, uh, who had been an early enthusiast of the French Revolution, that maybe he was a, a radical. And he didn't recognize that the French Revolution led to the guillotine and terrible things and, and all that. So they also knew that he was a man of the Enlightenment who had said some nice things about tolerance for religion. Whether you believe in one God or many gods or no God, he said, it doesn't hurt me and it shouldn't hurt you. So for a little statement like that, they were calling him uh, an atheist and a dangerous man, a threat to American religion, and so on. So the campaign got to be pretty nasty. And of course, in the American tradition, uh, when Jefferson was elected president in 1800, uh, he said in the famous speech, we are all Republicans, we are all uh, Federalists. And the idea was, the election's over now. We're not going to spread any more nasty stuff. We're all coming together in kumbaya and all that. But um, hopefully we can continue. That tradition has been strong in our American political strategies, techniques. Um, so now let's go right into the, uh, the business about uh, some prelim preliminary information about the way psychologists and historians have been thinking about how fake news resonates with the public. What are the characteristics we're going to find here as we see in this election of 1800? Scare tactics. The creation of a villain. That somebody sort of symbolizes all our problems. Jefferson, Adams, somebody symbolizes a lot of bad stuff. And because the, or the points made 
touch our emotions that we get very excited about little things that maybe somebody that's the other candidate uh, stood for something, did something, whatever it is, it might be something small. But just like today, we are very busy with our lives. It's hard to know everything about the tariff policy or what we should do with Iran and all of this. And so uh, we're so busy raising children, uh, you know, taking care of our business activities, our work, whatever it is, uh, following the Cleveland basketball team versus the, uh, the Warriors and all this stuff. There's so much in our lives that we don't kind of understand all that. So some little factoid that stirs the emotions will really often be the thing you'll remember when you go to the polls. And people understand that, politicians understand that, as they did in 1800. And so these little pieces of information are manufactured in a way that is intended to stir you up and you remember it when you have to make a vital decision. So to get a better understanding of this, we have to think about some brilliant minds of modern times who would give us ins can give us insights, uh, philosophers, psychologists, and so on. Perhaps a great man from television can give us an insight on this topic. Uh, oh, here we go. Stephen Colbert. <laughs> you may remember that among the many things he did when he had his own show on Comedy Central, uh, he would uh, play a, you know, a loudmouth uh, guy who everything he was saying really was intended to have the opposite effect. Colbert would say things, but the idea was he, you were supposed to realize this is over the top and crazy and wrong, but it makes you think about something. And one of the words he coined was truthiness. <laughs> truthiness, what is that? And he said in his famous, you can see it on, uh, just look up truthiness of Stephen Colbert on Google, you'll see he's talking about... Uh, People are thinking with their head too much, not with their heart. What really counts is, does it feel like the truth? <laughs> does it feel good? People are too caught up in books. Trust your gut. That's what really counts. So, for example, he, he was talking back in the early 2000s about a problem in foreign policy, and he said, uh, if the rationale for war with Iraq feels good, if it feels good to take out Saddam Hussein, then go with it. Go with your gut. Anyway, uh, the idea is that these words and ideas can make us angry, distrustful, <coughs> suspicious, and so on. So we look then into other aspects of psychology. <coughs> what do some of the psychologists have to, have to say about this? What do they say about the way we're receptive to false information? Why is that? And much of that research over the years has uh, demonstrated that when we have a stake in the ideas, we tend to buy into them much more. That is, so many of us are on a team, or we're tribal, or we're partisans. We belong to a party or a, a subculture, whatever it is, but we feel intensely about it. And so when we confront information that seems to support our views, we, as Stephen Colbert said, it feels right, feels good. But if the other ideas are Contrary to our beliefs, we feel some discomfort. Uh, and we listen, but we're not quite uh, ingesting these ideas fully. That's the idea. And so the argument would be that we have, uh, in advertising, we've understood this, that we, we present information to people, and we, you, you uh, fashion your advertising to the group you want to appeal to, that uh, you want to be on their team and so on. Politicians do it and all the rest. So, uh, here's a, a psychologist from long ago, back in the 1950s, but he was uh, offering some fascinating information that has been substantiated in various ways over the years. In fact, I just saw a study cited in the Sunday New York Times by Cass Sunstein of Harvard, who's been um, writing about a lot of things, but he was demonstrating some research he and his Harvard colleagues had done about political viewpoints, and <laughs> presto, look what we found. What he found was the same thing that uh, Fessinger, uh, Leon Fessinger uh, discovered long ago, and many others have been playing on this idea over the years. And it's this idea, the theory of cognitive dissonance. <laughs> so when we have some ideas, and then we're confronted with facts and evidence that run against those ideas and beliefs, we suffer cognitive dissonance, a discomfort, unhappiness. We tend to screen them out often, not always, but 
a lot of folks will screen out those ideas. They, they heard it, but they're not going to really accept it as it's just crazy ideas. But I, I stand by my beliefs. So the evidence doesn't support your prejudices, but people stand by this. So his point is, I, I can't quite read it there, but what does it say? Let me, uh, what does he say there? Something about we're supposed to be rational animals. Humans are not a rational animal. Yeah, but they're rationalizing. <laughs> yes, right. We're not so rational. So psychology often studies this. That why do we accept the irrational? What there must be a reason for it. How do we understand what's going on? And you came out with studies that when your group has a lot of you have a lot of other people in your group talking the same way, you feel much more comfortable. You don't suffer from cognitive dissonance if in a group you're with the other true believers. So Leonardo da Vinci. There he is, going way back hundreds of years, had something to say about this. This is so much more, as you can see in the new wonderful book by Walter Isaacson. I think it's called Leonardo da Vinci, something like that. That's a new sensation. But he said, da Vinci, the greatest deception men suffer is from their own opinions. <laughs> so we hang on to them. We're cemented to those opinions. Now I turn to a historian who is interested in social psychology, you might call it. Uh, and this guy's uh, book was started, started as an essay, and people just said, I love that essay. It's how fascinating. Let me talk about this. And then he said, well, I'll turn it into a book. The Paranoid Style in American Politics and Other Essays by Richard Hofstetter. He, too, was around a long time ago, 1950s, 1960s, when he was making his breakthrough. So the Paranoid Style, he was not talking about you and me and individuals like a psychologist or a psychoanalyst talking to someone on the couch. Uh, he's talking about groups that somehow they get uh, all excited and they begin to believe things, especially when they're told about conspiracies. He said there's been this long tradition in American life of uh, a brief periods where people go wild about a conspiracy theory. Uh, a long time ago, the Illuminati, some Bavarian secret society, has great power in society. And, uh, oh, that sounded pretty scary. We don't know about the Illuminati. The Masons, did you know they meet in secret in the 1830s? They were talking about that. Something fishy about those Masons. They got really angry about them. Uh, 1890s, when we had an economic crisis, a depression, the bankers of Wall Street, you farmers in Kansas, you know why you were having a hard time? So it was New York bankers and so on. And, so you, you get to look at these various conspiracies. And the one that was on his mind, uh, Richard Hofstetter, when he was writing in the 50s and the 60s, was the John Birch Society. And that uh, they believed communists were all over the country. Uh, even Dwight D. Eisenhower, the president, was suspicious in, in the minds of some with the Birch Society. And uh, one of the Birch supporters put out a book called None Dare Call It Treason. I have a copy back at home, and I look at it sometimes. And, it's interesting because uh, it presented facts, lots of facts, and then people said, I read this book, and it's got footnotes all over the back, and oh, it's lots and lots of footnotes. Well, the footnotes are highly inventive in their style, but they are, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it looked good in fact, so that's part of the game. Um, so what you have here is that, uh, as Hofstede and others would show, people fall for this stuff because it simplifies the complex. Uh, conspiracy theory or whatever, you know, the world is very complex. Three things are happening we don't understand how they're happening, why it's going on. Some of it affects our life, but if we have a sense that there's a simple answer, black and white, us versus them, a villain can be pointed to, then, oh, well now, thank you. Thank you for making the complex seem understandable. <coughs> now, you mentioned David, uh, Margaret Chase Smith's poll, Declaration of Conscience and dealing with Joseph McCarthy. I think that's a wonderful example of American history where we have uh, somebody he's seen in this picture holding up documents, and that was the kind of picture he wanted. That I've got evidence, I've got papers, I've got facts. When did he get on the radar screen of politics in America? He was just an obscure senator. He went to Wheeling, West Virginia, early 1950s, and he gave a speech. And he said, I have in my hands a piece of paper 205 known figures, I, I can't remember the exact language, but they're in the State Department, they have communist connections, and so on. And then people say, well, who are these journalists? Where are those 205? Who are they? 
He changed his numbers, uh, 57, and then he had some other number and so on. Uh, but he would uh, start to challenge anybody who <coughs> challenged him by asking, are you afraid to investigate communism in America? So here's the point I want to make about this story. Something else that we find in so many of these evidence, examples of fake news making a splash in American life. And that is, they don't happen in a vacuum. There is a context. There's something going on historically in the background. Various real facts, real developments, that tend to make the, uh, the statements about some fake news seem plausible, seem believable. And in McCarthy's time, you had, first of all, uh, he was supposed to be revealing spies. In the end, he didn't reveal much of anything in terms of real spies himself. But there had been the revelations that shocked people. Uh, Claude Fuchs helped the Russians get the atomic bomb. Uh, perhaps uh, Julius Rosenberg and his poor wife, who probably didn't have much to do with it, Ethel, you know, they, they got the electric chair for giving secrets. And the most shocking of all at the time was a man named Alger Hiss, a uh, great intellectual statesman and uh, respected by so many people. And how could he have been untrustworthy? And indeed, as discoveries have come out over the years, he was untrustworthy. So there were also uh, nations that were giving us shocking difficulties. We were frightened uh, to discover that the Russians in 1949 got the A-bomb. So now we were not the only ones with that powerful weapon. Very scary. And that China the most populous land on earth, suddenly went red. Red China, remember they used to talk about red China, the communist China. Communists are now spreading, and they'd show those maps in the movies, the blob was spreading and spreading and spreading and so on. And above all, when McCarthy made a speech, we were at war with communists. Our brave GIs were in Korea and dying, and it was a horrible situation. And so, talk about communists, in America, right here under our nose, you know, uh, in the State Department and so on, very frightening. And then it's simple. Oh, no wonder this thing's got out of control. People right here in America didn't have the guts to face up to the dangers, and thank goodness McCarthy's out there doing the job. It took people like Margaret Chase Smith and uh, Edward R. Murrow, journalists and others, to begin to w awaken us to what this man was doing. So. Much of it relates to the last point I want to make before we get into examples is that a lot of this fake news touches on fear. It's to frighten you and then stir your emotions and get you ready to do something. And that's a way that somebody can win. Uh, I'll just cite an example from 2000 uh, primaries when uh, in one party it was uh, McCain we hear a lot about John, so I'll bring up this example. John McCain was running, trying to run for president in 2000, and George W. Bush was trying to run. Now, uh, neither of these two fine gentlemen were trying to do something dirty, but the operatives, operate, uh, the, the strategists and so on, were trying to play some dirty tricks. And the one that they played uh, in South Carolina, where a very important primary was going on, this could launch somebody's career as a candidate for president of the one group spread news that John McCain had an African-American child in South Carolina. And for the rest of his life, John McCain was angry over that, that fake, bit of fake news that did him in in South Carolina. So one more example of how a little bit of embellishment of news can sometimes do some good, too. Let's keep that in mind. There are various sides of the coin. And my favorite example here is uh, in the 1940s, after World War II, we discovered the Russians were our new enemy, a real threat to America. The Cold War was beginning to stir. And uh, Harry Truman, the president, was having a difficult time. Oh, I'm sorry. Fear. Let me go back to us. <laughs> <laughs> that was when I, I meant to accentuate fear with these pictures. But here we go. Harry Truman and Arthur Vandenberg of Michigan, who had been an isolationist, but now recognized that the communist threat from the Soviets was real, and uh, Truman was having a hard time getting the American people to support uh, emergency aid to Greece and Turkey to save them from a communist overthrow. And uh, the famous words of Arthur Vandenberg to Truman, Mr. President, 
the only way you are ever going to get this, the money that is for these countries, is to make a speech and scare the hell out of the country. <laughs> and it worked. He did. So he took that message and worked with it and did scare people enough to get the money for the, uh, the Truman Doctrine to aid Greece and Turkey and on it went to the Marshall Plan and so many other things. So now let's go to campaigns and elections very quickly. Uh, let's see, I'm supposed to want to make sure, David, um, how, how 20 much? Minutes. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Here we go. <coughs> campaigns and elections. Fake news. Some of the, you might call this the greatest hits in America. <laughs> I mean that in two ways. These are some of the most notable examples, but also hits in the sense that they made an impact. That whether they made all the difference, you can debate, but they made some difference in turning elections. So what are those examples? Uh, one of my favorites, 1828, Andrew Jackson versus, now it's the son of John Adams, John Quincy Adams. So who do you want? Andrew Jackson who can fight? Or John Quincy Adams, who can write? <laughs> well, <laughs> they use such lines about that. And um, the, uh, they presented the, uh, the old hero, the old hero, Andrew Jackson, versus this uh, corrupt intellectual type, John Quincy Adams, who, do you all remember that when he was ambassador to Russia, did you know that he was providing a young girl for the pleasures of the Russian Tsar? No, of course you didn't know that, but to that fact, piece of fake news was spread during that election contest. And so anyway, Jackson, for a variety of reasons, Jackson won. It was a nasty contest. Some of the folks for uh, Adams uh, really played up the idea that uh, long ago, when Jackson fell in love with Rachel, um, Rachel was supposedly married to another man. The real truth is that uh, Rachel's husband was a, a real bum and abandoned her on many occasions and... Uh, it was very difficult on the Tennessee frontier to really get a divorce and a new marriage set up, and, but they, you know, it wasn't really such a horrible thing, but it was played up in politics, dirty politics. Okay, uh, let's go on to more modern elections where you might say some fibs were told uh, in order to accomplish something. And in this contest, 1940, FDR was uh, is running for a third term, and Wendell Wilkie, the Republican, said that to beat him, uh, you know, if this guy, Roosevelt's elected, he's going to send your boys to the war over there in Europe. And Roosevelt knew he had to do something, said, uh, give a famous speech on, huh? there's no chance, no, I'm not going to send your young boys over to fight in Europe. He knew darn well it was a very good possibility, the way things were moving, but uh, Wilkie, Wilkie heard that and he said, I'm doomed, I'm finished. The president said that and he'll win. And he did. Um, we look at uh, John F. Kennedy in his 1960 race, very close, extremely close. The dead people in Texas helped the vote for him and so on too. And in Chicago, Mayor Daley made sure some cemeteries were in action. <laughs> but anyway, uh, John F. Kennedy uh, won, but one of the ways he won in his speeches was to say, we have a terrible, terrible missile gap. You all know about Sputnik and the Russians are ahead of us. Huge missile gap. Our Republican administration hasn't done enough for our defense. He knew darn well that we were doing just fine in our uh, scientific development, technological development, but it worked in the election to some extent. And then here's another example. John Kerry, 2004. Look, the other side, a Democrat who gets hurt uh, by a Republican side, not really the administration of George W. Bush, but outside through these uh, uh, extra groups. Uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, PACs, right, political action committees. Uh, they uh, drummed up a uh, big argument with the book and then television ads that John Kerry's honors in Vietnam were not really true and this was false, false news as we now understand it, but it helped to do him in in a very close election. So uh, let's look at one more citation of examples, a different kind, the drumbeat for war, some of the Fake news that promoted wars of choice, I would call them. We've had a lot of wars in American history. Some were absolutely necessary. One could argue the American Revolution, uh, certainly um, World War II, and so on. But uh, some of the ones that are more debatable, well, let's look at the Spanish-American War. We know the stories about journalism, yellow journalism. Chet's thinking about this one, I'm sure, that um, uh, the, uh, the race between Pulitzer 
and uh, William Randolph's Hearst newspaper. And so Hearst had uh, a team going down there, Frederick uh, Remington, the artist, and uh, Remington said, I, I don't see anything there, and this uh, Davis is a writer too, I don't see anything going on, I don't see anything that terrible to report. And uh, told Remington, uh, the artist, uh, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war. And uh, so they got a little story about some Spanish yeah. were uh, checking on some American women, and so they dressed it up, that the naked woman being examined by the Spanish authorities, whoa, <laughs> uh, a drawing for the newspapers, and then the main blew up our ship, but no one knew what happened. Was it a boiler that exploded? Who, know, who knew at the time what happened? And yet uh, they just started screaming, remember the main to hell with Spain, and the slave drunk for war. Facts that are fake in some ways. Uh, Gulf of Tonkin re resolution that gave the president authority to go to war. Uh, we now know that uh, it was pretty much fake news and the evidence wasn't there. If anyone wants to talk about any of these, we can as we get to the end. But David's looking at me with the minutes ticking away, so I want to keep moving. Iraq war, uh, another example of a lot of fake news because um, uh, we all are horrified by the tragedy of 9 11, and we were then um, ready, you might say impressionable, if somebody said that uh, some cause is uh, easy to understand, and this is the reason this happened, and we must go do this, do that. Presidents have enormous power. They have the bully pulpit. And so when they say, <coughs> we must take this very strong diplomatic action, or even military action, most will go along. Lyndon Baines Johnson discovered that work. And, uh, and so did uh, George W. Bush's team. And so we had to talk about fake facts, factoids that really didn't hold up as time went on. Uh, the tubes that showed the, these were gonna be centrifuges for, uh, for all kinds of things, atomic weapons. Uh, uranium is coming from Niger in Africa. Fake news we now know. Hans Blix, uh, the, the UN inspector was there looking and he said, I, I, hour by hour, day by day, I, we don't find any weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we're doing very well, we're looking everywhere, give us some more time, but the drumbeat for war was moving quickly. And uh, we heard talk about WMD, weapons of mass destruction, mushroom clouds, a lot of people were frightened and ready to go. So, above all, it's this connection between one event and the other event. What the 9-11 the tragedy and Saddam Hussein, who had essentially nothing to do with 9-11, maybe a little bit, but nothing really significant to do with it, yet it leads us into war. So, last point I wanna make is uh, about psychology of language. We all remember uh, emotional power of words in American politics and society generally. Uh, we think of George Orwell, right? 1984, Newspeak. And uh, he was thinking about how communist and fascist regimes use language to fool the people, to give them fake news in a sense. And so we look at the history and very quickly, jumping, jumping quickly across this, what are some of the stellar examples of fake information, somewhat, or embellished information that leads us in the wrong direction. I would argue on time to get into this, but Andrew Jackson, I'm gonna give him a, a slap on the uh, arm for this one, uh, his attack on the Bank of the United States, which was doing pretty good work for our economy, and yet he called it the monster, and it's got these tentacles all over you, and you know, every community in America, all its power from a bunch of wealthy aristocrats in Philadelphia, not out here in the West, and so he created a false narrative that led us to destroy that bank. And it operated somewhat like the Federal Reserve does today to keep us on balance in our economic development. And what followed? A horrible depression. 1837 to about 1841, 42. Terrible depression when you read about it. Hurt a lot of people. Banks crashed. People lost all their money. Uh, and so it was a bad move. What's this? Uh, oh, uh, words. Law and order. They, they were, again, it's a context, right? There was disorder. There, were, there was the, uh, the protests and demonstrations. There was a, a, spur, a spurge in crime in the 60s, all these things. And so there was a, a way of talking about law and order that resonated with the public. Now, it's not entirely false, really, but it was playing on 
the emotion. <laughs> <laughs> liberal. Liberal used to be a word of pride. The studies show that in the 1960s, early 60s, when you ask, are you a liberal? People say, oh, yeah, I'm a proud liberal. And then the other side, the conservative side, decide, well, let's, let's work on that term and give it a lot of bad connotations. Liberal is, you know, are you a liberal? Are you really worth interested in the welfare and all those things. Well, anyway, liberal became so scary that uh, uh, liberals decided, I'm a progressive. No, I'm a progressive. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to Axis of Evil to get our stir, get us stirred up about in the war, but I'll take uh, this one, Obamacare. <laughs> Poor Mr. Obama and his team, they should have recognized that this is an old trick that when you give a name to something that's very important and powerful in society, and uh, you attach it to this leader, uh, it looks like the leader is overreaching, he's sticking his hands into your life, and uh, using too much of power, abusing the authority of the executive office. So by calling it Obamacare, it was a carefully contrived play with language. And it worked, and uh, it scared a lot of people. And Obama eventually had to say, you know, well, I guess it's part of our language and I'll accept it and take pride, but it, it was always harmful. He should have said, um, how about, uh, you know how Social Security is now embraced by so many? You're not going to take away your Social Security, right? He could have, could have called it uh, Health Security. <laughs> but it was called the, the Affordable Care Act. In fact, the full title was even longer than that. And so the wordsmiths missed it. They, they lost their chance, and then the other side began to break the label of Obamacare. Um, the genius of language... Oh, oh I forgot that a few more here. Uh, the Democrats attacked Mitt Romney. Uh, 47%, 1%, and so on. So they used that very effectively to get Romney. And then the most recent Democratic candidate, when you think of two words that resonated across the political spectrum and stirred people, a lot of people, with fear, worry, that if any two words could identify this woman's danger to America, it would be Benghazi. Oh, something happened in Benghazi in Libya. I don't know exactly what it was, but something about that nothing. Studies, committees have studied it. Nothing, really, that she's to blame for. And uh, emails, of course, became a, a big thing. So of course, emails were an issue. Um, so the genius, the, of all the wordsmiths that play politics and are strategists, the best, the most brilliant, is a man named Frank Luntz. He's been on the Republican team. And uh, he's found brilliant ways to uh, massage the language. One example, uh, Democrats like to talk about the estate tax. So what images do you conjure up? Oh, a big mansion and so on. Those people with these giant mansions, yeah, they should when they die, you know. You should tax uh, the wealth of that, that family. So he said, Frank Lutz, let's change it. Let's call it the death tax. Oh, you say, I guess we're all going to die sometime. And then my poor family, even though I have, I have a few, I only have $1,000 in the bank, but my poor families, they're going to get the $1,000. So I'll go with this other cause. That, uh, he was very effective. In fact, one of the other things he did, uh, he said, uh, you know how we all talk about uh, global warming? He said, that's scaring a lot of people, global warming. Whoa, I, I did, yeah, I noticed that summer's getting hotter and all this. So let's change it to climate change. And many people say, yeah, I guess climate is always changing, so it's not so bad. <laughs> anyway, he seems to have succeeded in that effort. Now, we finally end here. Uh, why now? What's going on? Why is it so much more pervasive now? Let's talk about fake news. And uh, what should we think about it? <coughs> What's going on? Why is it happening? And uh, can we do anything about it? Are we doomed to be uh, swimming in a sea of fake news for the immediate future or for a long time? What can we say? Well, I would like to look at this historically, very briefly, and think about uh, the way things have changed that in the na national media, there's always a kind of revolution every so many years. Something new comes along, a new way of communication. And so when the printing press came along, if, if you go way back to the 1440s, the Gutenberg press, to the 1830s in America, when the steam press and others came into 
uh, production, and now you could produce newspapers in abundance and cheaply, the penny press, they called it. Uh, and so it really led to a lot of partisan press that so many different groups, different uh, enthusiasts for some candidate or some issue and so on, you could put out pamphlets and uh, booklets and you could put out newspapers and all that, so this led to a kind of revolution. And then along came television that began to change things. At first it was advertising. This is more modern advertisement for Dorito chips, but on the left, but uh, whether it's soap or cereal, whatever you want, uh, cars, we can advertise, and then the politicos began to get into it. This is a very early picture of uh, an effort to uh, stir up uh, the public through advertising. It was very awkward, simplistic advertising for Eisenhower in the 1950s, and then it became much more sophisticated as time went on with TV. So that was a, a revolution that began to change things. And people were frightened for a while. Oh my God, you know, this is the end of Western civilization as we know it. But <coughs> we, we began to learn, at least to some extent, learn how to deal with it. And then came the, the newest revolution, uh, social media. I mean, YouTube is only since 2006. Yes, each of these, how old are they? Just, you know, 10 or so years in so many cases, even less sometimes than the new social media. Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and all of this. And so it's uh, made a big splash. And we're wondering, are we now doomed to this fake news? Uh, here's an MIT study that just came out. I'm going to end very quickly here. MIT study. Uh, this is a summary of the finding. It's just been widely reported. <clears throat> they, they, they look at all the Twitter accounts, thousands and thousands of them, that they could get their hands on. Hands on. They said, the, sim the summary, the truth simply cannot compete with hoax and rumor. By every common metric, falsehood consistently dominates the truth on Twitter. The study finds fake news and false rumors reach more people, penetrate deeper into the social network, <coughs> and spread much faster than accurate stories. <coughs> A recent poll showed that 62% of the American adults get their news from the social media. And of those, 62%, 71% of them get it from Facebook. Now, put that in your mind when you consider the other news flash that we got just recently, a summary, the numbers kept expanding and expanding and expanding, and the latest numbers are as follows. That the Russian agents spread 126 million false messages across Facebook at the time of the 2016 election, that they spread 131,000 messages on Twitter and put out 1,000 plus videos on YouTube that were untruthful. Now, the point is that uh, as people see this in the magic of social media, you say, I like it. I'll send it to Sally and George and so on. And Sally and George, I, I love it. Oh, yeah, Sam and, and, and Mary, but take a look at this. And so it spreads out. <clears throat> so the point that they're often making these days, okay, is that the, uh, the mainstream media, which would usually vet the news and uh, edit things and be cautious about what they're reporting. And we used to get, remember the old, uh, anyone old enough to remember the three television networks with uh, Walter Cronkite, and <laughs> Douglas Brinkley, and those guys, but uh, they didn't have much to say in the 15 minutes or sometimes in 30 minutes, but uh, news reporting, but uh, you had a general feeling that it's, it's mainstream and so it's been vetted, it's been studied, they're not going to put out much that's not true. But in this vast universe today, it's suddenly so readily available. Turn to the internet, millions of choices you can have of getting some information and Facebook and all the rest. And, uh, and television, and radio, and abundance of stations, hundreds of television stations, and some of them reporting various aspects of news, as they call it. So the last one is this. Is this uh, dangerous? Is it a threat to democracy? Should we begin to say, oh my god, it is the end of Western civilization, or world civilization, as we know it. Can we be pessimistic about democracy? How are we going to understand the way the the evidence stands in order to make smart decisions if the evidence is skewed and manipulated. 
I want to point out in conclusion that much good has come out of this technological revolution, the digital revolution. If you have a, a relative in France right now, maybe your son or daughter, you want to speak to them, and there you are on Skype. Uh, if you want to self-publish, if you want to uh, find a venue for your uh, article, your argument, and so on, you can probably find a place, you can connect. There's so much opportunity. So it's that old you know, cliche, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, there's a lot that's good here, and there's a lot that's not good. And so, to me, the stunning historical revelation is that it's only happened in the last year or so, maybe a year and a half, that we suddenly realized, whoa, <laughs> Facebook and, and Twitter and all the stuff can lead us into uh, a bad rabbit hole. We, we don't want to be here, so why don't we uh, try to figure out what's going on? So this whole idea of coming to grips with the challenge and doing something about it is fresh in our minds right now. And I have hope that we will, and Chet going to have to take the, the football on this one, uh, I have hope, some optimism, that we will find ways as we have over history. It will never be perfect. We'll always be vulnerable as we've seen to fake news. So now let's summarize as we come to the end, and I'm going to step back to a little bit, if I can read what I've got here. Uh, so we've got the, um, the psychology, the fact that it's sometimes manipulated. I'm stepping away for a minute. That they tap our emotions, they build on fear, uh, they create suspicion, and so on. And so those who are manipulating fake news are playing the game of us versus them. Then. Uh, this truthy, this idea that why do we want to believe this? Why do we go for it? Uh, a lot of the psychological research shows that we don't like uh, cognitive dissonance. We don't like that discomfort. And so we, uh, we tend to go with uh, the narrative that's our belief system. And then content, the context rather. As I say, there's something going on usually that makes the fake news seem plausible. There's something out there that's developing and uh, that's real that makes... Uh, the embellishments seem like it might, it might be real. Now, uh, the impact on politics, we can see it's in elections, it's been in the drumbeat for war, and of course we want to be cognizant of language that has often been designed cleverly to stir us up. And at last, uh, this last point that uh, with the social media, we now have a, it's a real revolution it's in, it is real, bigger, stronger, more powerful than ever before. It is significant. We're facing a serious challenge, but we've got to figure out what to do, and as we have in the past, usually try to come up with some answers. Now, the final point is I want to say, uh, if there's anybody ever in politics, let's say, who gave us one little quotation that summarizes this whole point we've been wrestling with, about the tension between fact and fiction in our public life, who would that person be? What person, what famous quotation becomes almost a cliche now because we often cite it and we say, this guy got to the heart of it some decades ago. And the man, of course, is Daniel Patrick Moynihan, <laughs> who you've heard of before. <laughs> he said, you are entitled to your own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. Well, right? yeah. uh, All right. <laughs>